Good evening. I said good evening. Good evening. All right. Buenas noches. It's good to be here at Lone Star and in Kingwood. Um, so uh, again, I'm Max. I'm from TCU. And I'm going to talk about uh, what, what Professor Barr set me up for. If you're tweeting by chance, I'm at Professor Max K. Uh, otherwise, leave your phone somewhere not in sight because it's distracting for all of us. All right. So Blue Texas, right? Um, you all know, if you've paid any attention to the news at all, that in 2018, uh, Ted Cruz narrowly defeated Beto O'Rourke in the U.S. Senate race, but it was close, closer than expected, uh, closer than many uh, thought it would be, 50.9% to 48.3, a margin of just 215,000 votes. So when I first started writing this book, the idea of a blue Texas sounded absurd. Today it seems to make a little bit more sense to people, right? Uh, for Democrats, this margin of, of defeat represented progress. Texas may now indeed be becoming purple. It might be a battleground state, as Professor Barr said. On the other hand, the Cook Political Report rates Texas today as likely Republican, which is an improvement for Democrats over solid Republican, but by contrast, places like Georgia and North Carolina are lean Republican, which is closer to a toss-up, right? So toss-ups here, lean Republican, Texas is still likely Republican. So it remains red for most outsiders and insiders. On the other hand, I'm going to argue that Texas is, in fact, already blue. Right? It's not the culturally, fiscally conservative, free enterprise, capitalist haven that has been promoted by the Republican Party. And in fact, it never was. The cowboy conservatism of the state has always been challenged by community organizers, by civil rights activists, and by liberal and radical political movements. So my book and my talk today look back at this hidden history of Texas uh, and community organizing in Texas to rethink the present moment and to uncover the future, perhaps, of Texas and America. So this is what it looked like. You can look that way if you can't quite see it. In the 1960s, strange as it may now seem today, four groups came together to confront uh, both Jim Crow and his cousin, what I call Juan Crow. African Americans, Mexican Americans, labor, organized labor, and liberals came together in this thing they called the Democratic Coalition. They were fighting segregation, directed both at African Americans and at Mexican Americans. They were fighting for liberal politics. Um, they were fighting to take over the Democratic Party. So I'll pause real quick and say the whole blue-red thing is new language, right? It didn't exist uh, back in the 1960s, and Texas was a solid democratic state. It was part of the solid South. But it was run by conservative segregationists, self-identified Dixiecrats, right, who had close ties to big business and who wanted to keep Texas um, very conservative, very segregated, uh, very anti-union, and they were struggling to do so. So my book tells the story of how these different groups came together. Uh, ultimately to fight for, the Demo for control in the Democratic Party, to make it a liberal party like it is now today, uh, and to defeat segregation. Uh, again, I'll pause real quick and provide some context for you all. Right? So there's a system of Jim Crow, segregation right, uh, of African Americans, which was a system established to dominate African Americans, right? not just to separate them somewhere else, to keep African Americans poor, working uh, in the fields, ideally, or in low-wage jobs in the city. There was a parallel system of segregation created in South Texas and West Texas that I call Juan Crow. And this was a system that didn't have the same state statutes, but it did still have the force of law, right? And when you stepped out of the bounds of Juan Crow, right, whatever that might be, you could face reprisals from law enforcement, uh, you could face imprisonment, um, you went to segregated schools, right, that were state run. So there was a, a, another system of segregation. And when you look at this slide, it might jump out at you, right? Okay, African Americans and Mexican Americans working together. But in fact, these groups were neither natural enemies nor natural allies, right? They didn't come together naturally. They didn't have this vague sense of a shared history of oppression. Rather, they, had, they were different. They were from different neighborhoods, different cultures. They spoke sep uh, different languages, um, practiced sort of disparate customs. Um, 
had different priorities. So when they did come together in this coalition, it was because not of fate and not because of demographics or some vague shared uh, similarity, but rather history, right? Relationships, people building relationships with one another across the color line and ultimately coming together in common cause. Indeed, each of these groups are sort of the left wing of their respective communities. They ran into intra-racial conflicts, conflicts with their so-called social betters within each racial group, right? African-American activists um, might have uh, a different perspective from middle-class self-appointed race leaders, say. So distinctions of class and strategy, all of these things mattered as much as did ties of ethnicity. And so for civil rights activists, the people on this slide, what they learned beginning in the 1930s and through the 1960s was that they actually had a lot in common with people across the color line, even as they had um, conflicts within their own groups. Um, and coalition building, building this funnel, right, this, this nice graphic that I made, right, building this coalition is what allowed them to outflank more conservative race leaders and actually fight for civil rights and for liberal politics. So I just want to say quickly, right, a coalition like this is messy, right? It's not natural, it's not foreordained. Um, indeed, it's nowhere near as neat as this slide makes it look. It came together in different locations across the state. It came back apart, there was conflict, people argued over whose issues were being prioritized, what, uh, what struggle they were gonna fight first. Um, and they only held together because in the trenches, right, of fighting for political power, fighting for self-determination, fighting for their communities, they managed to um, build these lasting interpersonal bonds. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history today, and then I'm gonna switch over and get into um, the more present politics, right? The title of the talk is Looking Back to the Future. So there's four wings, right, of this democratic coalition. The first on here is Albert Pena, uh, and his wing here, you can kind of see the, on, the, on the left side, the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations. So Albert Pena was a veteran of World War II. He was born and raised in, in San Antonio, actually came to Houston to study law, uh, and while in Houston, got involved in liberal democratic politics for the first time. He went back to San Antonio where he joined the American GI Forum, which is a, an organization of Mexican-American veterans, as well as LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens. They formed a, 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 another group that was kind of a wing of the Democratic Party, and eventually PASO, Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations. Now this picture shows Peña, right, now elected county commissioner, but he didn't start out that way. He started out as a civil rights lawyer. And he would be asked by different communities to come in and try to desegregate the schools. In the 1950s, they were still segregated. There were all white, all Anglo schools across South and West Texas, and they simply refused to admit Mexicans, right? It was illegal, it was unconstitutional, the courts had already ruled by this point. But what the, what the school districts did was they said, oh, okay, we're gonna segregate not based on your national origin, but based on your language ability. So if your last name is Rodriguez, or Garcia, or lo que quiere, right? If, if they thought you were a Spanish speaker, you were a Spanish speaker, and you were tracked into a separate uh, uh, school based on that. So Albert Pena helped organize parents to fight this. He filed lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. They didn't go anywhere. So he then um, learned something new, right, with these parents. Instead of filing more lawsuits, they just went to the white school and tried to sign up on, on the first day of classes. And when they returned back, they went to the back of the line, and they did it again. And they had so many people that no one else could go to school. So they, they engaged in this direct action demonstration, which meant that the school couldn't operate. So the school calls up TEA, the Texas Education Agency, says, what do we do? TEA says, well, the law says you have to let them in. So they do, problem solved, right? Took an hour. What, what months and years of lawsuits could not. So Pena takes that energy and he then translates it back into a bunch of different fights within San Antonio and then into electoral politics where they build for the first time a Mexican-American wing of the, of the Democratic Party there. He helps elect Henry B. Gonzalez to the city council and later he, Gonzalez becomes a congressman, a very famous congressman from Texas. Uh, and Pena and his, his organization ultimately put him in as, as, as county commissioner uh, and as a leader of the statewide campaign in 1960 to elect John F. Kennedy as president, right? So that's one wing. I'll run through the others. The African-American wing of the coalition was the Texas Council of Voters. You can see a number of folks here. Um, the guy in the middle is Thurgood Marshall, the famous attorney for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. This, um, 
wing of the coalition really began uh, in Houston to a great extent where African American uh, blue collar workers along the docks in the rail railroads uh, and other kind of uh, occupational sectors, oil as well, the early oil refineries, all these black workers came together and formed unions in the 1930s and 40s and they used these unions to advocate for not just better wages but for civil rights as well. So the guy on the bottom right, his name is Moses Leroy, he was a, a Houston not a native, but came here fairly young. He's old in this picture. Came here fairly young in life. Um, uh, and he was a, a main organizer along the docks, uh, I'm sorry, in the railroad yards, as well as of the NAACP. So the Houston chapter of the NAACP during World War II grew to become the second largest in all of America, right? only after Detroit. And it was filled with these black industrial workers who had a broad vision of civil rights that linked it, not just the struggle against Jim Crow, but the fight for economic justice. And among other things, they accomplished you know, a number of Supreme Court victories, right? You all know the case Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Well, the key precedent for Brown was a case that came out of Houston, right? That they're actually arguing in this photo, right? Uh, the case of Heman Sweat versus Painter. The, uh, Sweat was a black postal worker and union activist who when he couldn't get promoted, decided to go to law school. The Texas, University of Texas wouldn't admit him because he was black. So he sued them and they ended up going to the Supreme Court and winning, breaking open higher education for everybody, right? And ultimately giving the court the precedent for Brown. All right, third wing is the white independent liberals. That's what they called themselves because they didn't have an organization after the 1960s. Uh, but they did before that have something called the Democrats of Texas. Uh, and the woman in this photo is actually from Houston also, Mrs. Frankie Carter Randolph. She um, was a kind of wealthy white society lady, right? who uh, for whatever reason broke away from her family fortune, adopted some liberal politics and put a bunch of money into helping groups get organized. And their biggest victory was in the 1950s. Uh, they elected a United States Senator, 1957. His name was Ralph Yarborough. And Ralph Yarborough was one of the more liberal US senators ever to be elected from the American South. Right? And he came out of this organizing of, of liberals in Texas with support from African Americans and from some Mexican Americans. Um, and this group, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, we, if you want to know more, you can ask, right? But they were kind of the, out in the wilderness fighting to make the, um, the Democratic Party more like the National Party, right? They wanted to bring the New Deal to Texas, bring better services, bring supports, bring a welfare state to Texas for all. And last is organized labor. Uh, okay, quick question, how many of you all have ties in your family to, to a labor union? Someone in your family who's a labor union member. Okay, that's always interesting to see, right? <laughs> we did better among the older set, I noticed, than among the younger, right? So Texas, we don't think of as a union state, but in the 1950s and 60s, it did have a very strong labor movement, right? The AFL-CIO, American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations. And it was led by a plumber from San Antonio named Hank Brown. Uh, and Hank Brown was a very um, uh, forward-thinking union member. Uh, he, he, over time, he was from San Antonio as well, so he started working with Albert Pena and with other folks in, in building nor local alliances for civil rights and for liberal politics, and eventually he comes to understand that for labor to grow, they need to move beyond their historic stronghold among white uh, uh, operatives, like semi-skilled workers in the refineries and the aircraft plants and places like that, and actually go out and organize um, unskilled workers, African Americans and Mexican Americans, um, agricultural workers, all these sectors that labor hadn't really touched. And at its height, um, organized labor represented about 17% of Texas wage employees, so about one in six. So if I had asked you that same question, right, 50 years ago, probably all of you would have raised your hand, especially at a community college, right, that someone you knew, someone in your family was a union member. All right, so, um, it's a long story, it's all in the book, right? This group first starts coming together in the 1930s. As I mentioned before, they, they come together and they fight with each other a lot. Uh, their alliances break apart. They argue over um, how quickly to push on civil rights, for example. They argue about um, uh, you know, how to fit in issues that affected Mexican Americans that weren't always seen as a priority. Um, and they argued in part because the white liberals, the independent liberals, tended to think of themselves as the people who understood how change would happen, right? They, they thought, oh, we've been fighting the segregationists for decades. 
Um, we, we've, we know the game of politics. We've been playing it for a long time. Uh, we can't push too hard too fast or we're gonna end up um, messing, up, messing up the larger cause, right? Easy for them to say, they're not the ones that are most effective by Jim Crow segregation or by Juan Crow segregation, right? So this paternalism, this attitude that they could dictate this, the pace of change ultimately became obsolete. In the 1960s, these different groups, right, this group in particular, right, they lead sit-ins at lunch counters all across the state of Texas. Mexican Americans are marching across the state of Texas. They're pushing for power within the local Democratic parties. They're helping to elect John F. Kennedy as president. Um, and so finally they come together in this democratic coalition and, and the white liberals are forced to understand African Americans and Mexican Americans as the leaders of change and to eventually get behind their, their issues, right? To make civil rights the top priority. And when they did that, this coalition came together, right? When it became, let's not just pussyfoot around the issues, let's make fighting racism our top number one priority, right? It became a very cohesive and powerful coalition that, um, uh, that, that um, helped every group sort of transition into a new phase. Um, it grew. By 1963, they launched a massive march on Austin. It was the same day as the March on Washington, August 28th, right? There's a, more than 1,000 people marching from East Austin, and it's a mixed group, African Americans, Mexican Americans, and whites. Uh, and what they, again, what they learned is that the more liberal their politics, the more committed they were to integration, the more effective they could become. Um, there's a, at the March on Washington, right, there's a great speech one of, the, one of the leaders gives, he says, they'll never separate the Negro and the Latin American again, right, which of course are outdated terms. But the point, right, is that African Americans, Mexican Americans, he says, they'll never separate labor and the Negro again. They'll never separate the independent white man from these groups again, right? that this coalition is cohering and that they can then now challenge the political structure of Texas. And they did. They launched a huge um, voter registration drive uh, as well as um, a get out the vote effort. You can see this is a, a photo uh, of one of their flyers, right? And it shows on here, organized labor, PASO, the coalition is helping to awaken what they called the sleeping giant of Mexican American voting power, right? So they were successful at the polls. They were successful in politics because they tied what they were doing in the elections to these broader social movements for civil rights, right? They would go and they would march together, they would protest together, they would do sit-ins together, and they would also go and register voters together and turn them out to go to the polls. So in 1964, they, had, uh, they created a massive volunteer organization, an army of volunteers, um, and uh, some 10,000 block workers signed up to voluntarily join their campaign. Um, and they hired a whole bunch of African-American and Mexican-American staffers to lead this voter turnout effort. Um, and they were wildly successful, right? They transformed the political map of Texas. They broke open the doors to the Democratic Party. Right? They, they, they succeeded over time in, in transitioning it from being the, the party of conservative segregationists to being a party that was multiracial, multiethnic, and, and committed to liberal politics. They recruited some of the great leaders they made the, the new Texas political map where the cities become dark blue, right? And surrounded by red suburbs. Um, and in the end, they were able to force Texas to modernize, right? To, to implement the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65 and 75. They did the work on the ground of finally bringing civil rights to Texas. At the same time, they fell short. Right? They fell short of their wildest goals, leaving work to be done and a blueprint for how to do it. So that's what my book tells that story, right? The blueprint. If you want to read more, you can go buy one over there. I'll be happy to sign a copy for you, right? Get it on Amazon, whatever. Um, I, it'll tell you the, the story in greater detail. But what I want to do for the rest of my time today is kind of talk about what this history means for the present moment, right? For, for politics in more recent years. Um, you know, the sleeping giant metaphor is still with us, right? You may have heard it before, right? The, the rise of the Latino vote is not yet complete. Uh, in fact, when I look at these documents, primary sources from the 1950s and 60s, people talk about uh, Mexican-American demographic change and votes in almost the exact same way that they talk about them today. Right? <laughs> uh, the language has not shifted much. 
right? But the politics has, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So turning to 2016, more recent history. It really began earlier. The energy of Obama's campaigns in 2008 and 2012 led to efforts to revitalize the Democratic Party in Texas. It had basically been dead or dying since 1994, right? Uh, and it, um, with Obama came a bunch of new efforts to create new organization in the state. A group called Battleground Texas began um, and, and began going out and trying to build organization. Um, Wendy Davis's campaign in 2014 actually kind of set that back a little bit. But by 2016, the map looked like this, right? This is probably familiar to you all. Right? The major cities of the state are, are blue uh, to varying degrees of darkness, right? The lighter the color, the, the closer the margin. So the deep dark red is a heavy Republican margin, the deep dark blue is a heavy Democratic margin in, in, in between. So you can see in Houston the margin, the percentage margin is small, but the overall numbers were huge, right? Even though it was 54 to 42, that's a huge margin of votes that were won in the process. Um, you can see where I live, Fort Worth. On this map, it's still red, but it's becoming a very light red. And in fact, in Fort Worth in 2016, Hillary Clinton did carry the city, right? But not all of Tarrant County. You can see on here, Fort Bend County, just southwest of Houston, is a light blue. It was the first time it had switched and really was the first suburban county in Texas to flip from, from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, right? Um, but what ended up happening here in Texas was that even the cities, the Democratic strongholds in the Valley, they didn't run up large enough margins to turn the state, right? Which Trump in the end won very easily. Um, and pretty much the story in 28 is, is simil 2018 is similar. I'll come back to that in a minute. All right, here's the breakdown by race. Exit polls are rather unreliable. You can see it's a small number of people that are surveyed, particularly among Latinos. Um, there's been later analyses that have shown how bad the original data were. Um, however, you can see that Texas politics mirrored nationwide politics when it comes to demographics. Um, but there's a few key points kind of buried in here that I think are really important for Texas, for the South, for the nation. African Americans were far less enthusiastic about Hillary Clinton, right, than they had been about Obama four years earlier. You can see only 84% uh, for Clinton, which is a relatively low number. And then on, on the line with Latinos, right, the original uh, analyses were wrong. The post-election ones by Archuleta and um, uh, Pedraza were much better, and they showed that Latinos came out 77 to 80 uh, percent in favor of Hillary Clinton. Asian Americans continued to vote in large numbers for Democrats, but they were, um, remained a relatively small slice of the Texas electorate, a very fast-growing slice of the Texas electorate, but still small. And then, of course, there's white folks who voted overwhelmingly for Trump while turning out in high numbers. And that cut across class lines. There's a lot we could talk about on that front if you want later on. Um, and it cut across gender lines, right? White women voted for Trump also. All right, so here is, um, sorry. Yeah, okay. So you can see here there's a lot of discussion around turnout. Whites in Texas outnumbered all other groups combined, right? That's what this slide shows. Um, in 2016, right, 5.9 million white folks voted. All the other groups combined don't come close to that. Um, again, Asian American turnout was way up, certainly decisive in flipping Fort Bend County, right, outside of Houston. Um, and if you look year over year from 2012 to 16, the turnout among Latinos, listed as Hispanic on this slide, was very, pretty much unchanged, right? Almost no change. And this is despite the years and years of work of Battleground Texas and other groups to try to start moving the needle there, including the State Democratic Party, right? Um, side note, the State Democratic Party in 2012 had a staff of four people. Four people, right? <laughs> so by 2016, they had scaled up to 40 people, which still isn't very much for a state as big as this one. Um, so right, despite their efforts, they weren't moving very far. Um, most alarming on this slide, you can see that African-American turnout and the number of votes actually fell between 2012 and 2016. Fewer African-Americans voted, a fewer percentage voted, and those are the numbers in red. 
right? So there's no path to victory for Democrats in which that's true. A, small, a shrinking share of the African-American vote, a lack of enthusiasm among African-Americans is gonna spell trouble. Many Democratic strategists and others, political analysts across the spectrum, they look at these numbers and they say, clearly Democrats need to focus on Latinos, right? That can't be the only group that matters, right, as I just said. And moreover, right, there's all this discussion that demographic change is gonna inevitably produce change uh, at the polls, gonna inevitably switch the partisan alignment. As I said, people have been saying that for 50 or 60 years. And in fact, there's new research by my colleague Rogelio Sainz at UTSA that shows that the Texas population of whites is actually growing much faster than thought, both naturally, right, natural reproduction, and from in-migration. And that people who are migrating to Texas, white folks migrating to Texas, um, are voting Republican. Right? They move to Texas in part because they see it as a red state. Right. So that's bad news if your goal is demographics are gonna fix this, right? If you think demographics are gonna turn Texas blue, the, the numbers are not anywhere near as good as has been assumed, right? So instead, it's really a question of organizing. It's not just registering voters, but actually getting them to the polls, right? If you go out in the street, most people will say, oh, we just need to go register more folks, right? And that may be true in smaller local races, a, a small amount of registration can make a really big difference. But at the state level, it's really about turnout. So if you, one way to see this is to compare Texas to its great foil of California, right? You all hear the slogan, don't California my Texas, right? Don't, or all this juxtaposition of, of these two states, right? I, um, I could go for their beaches, but that's a side, a side point, right? What you can see when you look at this is the critical number is, the, is kind of the second line, the voting age population, the percentage of voting age population registered. So this is everyone of voting age population who's eligible, right? So it does not include immigrants, it wouldn't include disenfranchised felons, things like that. It doesn't include children. But 78% of the voting age population that's eligible is registered in both states. Right? So registration is not the problem. Right? It's not what's holding Democrats back. California votes on election day and Texas doesn't. That's, what's, that's the difference, right? Those bottom lines. Of the voting age population in Texas, 58.74% voted. In, in, Cal, in Texas only, I'm sorry, California 58.74, in Texas only 46. So the question is why? I'd say there's two main reasons. Number one, Nobody has ever really invested in the work of organizing and turning out unlikely voters, people who aren't, don't go on their own every year, the people who need a little bit of extra support and encouragement. No one's ever done the work. We know how to do it. If you go and you make contact with somebody in person five times, they vote, right? So it's just about putting enough people in the field to build those relationships and do it. Um, you know, number two that's related is an enthusiasm gap, right? In 2016 in particular, right, people were far more enthusiastic about Trump than they were about Clinton, right? Their partisans for Clinton were not all that excited about her, right? The people who were excited about Trump were very excited about Trump. Um, and relatedly, right, I think the reason for that was that partisan politics, elections, electoral politics were disconnected from people's daily lives, right? To go back to the history I talked about, the Democratic coalition worked because it connected social movements, it connected the struggle against racism, it connected people's daily experiences to coming out and voting, right? They would, they would distribute block worker kits that said, they would call them freedom kits, right? They would say, go vote for freedom. But by 2016, Hillary Clinton's appeals, right, had nothing to do with people's daily lives and that um, it was just about partisan politics and people didn't respond, right? Whatever you think of Hillary Clinton, <laughs> the data shows people didn't care, right? 2018. These are two maps, the left one is 16, the one I showed you before, the one on the right is 2018. Um, that enthusiasm gap seems to have narrowed, right? <laughs> Beto O'Rourke managed to uh, turn out a lot of people and get them really, really excited about the election. Uh, Trump and opposition to Trump got people very excited, which I'm gonna come back to. But you can see here the map more or less looks the same, right? There's a little bit of variation. Um, and especially, right, uh, Point number one, I said, the reason why Democrats weren't winning, Beto did build a, an organization. He built a turnout machine on a scale unseen since the Democratic Coalition of 1964. Um, 
But, but basically what the result was, was the, the trends that we could see visibly in 16 were continuing in 18. So cities like Dallas uh, became bluer, darker blue, the suburbs became less red, and then some of them actually flipped. So you can see Fort Bend County between the two maps, it becomes a somewhat wider margin. You can see the uh, outside of Houston to the south, there's Brazoria County and Galveston counties, both of which go from really dark red to light red. Right? Fort Worth, Tarrant County, where I live, went from red to blue. So did Williamson County and Hayes County outside of Austin in the center of the map. Um, overall, not much real change. Um, you can see there's one little county down in South Texas that went from blue to red. Uh, I looked it up, there was a total of 180 votes cast in that county. So the margin was 100 for Trump, or I mean 100 for Cruz, 77 for O'Rourke, and three for a, a third party candidate. <laughs> so don't read too much into that. One problem, right, with these maps is every county is shaded and it has nothing to do with how big they are. So another visualization would be to show you this where there's like a different size dot based on how big the turnout was. And then you can see, you know, the data that's also here, right? So even though there's been all this attention paid to the suburbs, the Williamson, Hayes, you can see the two counties north of Dallas-Fort Worth became lighter red also. That's Collin and Denton counties. Um, I think the, 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 the narrative of suburban shift may be rather short term and maybe somewhat illusory in the long term. Um, what's really happening that's, I think, more long term and more important is the ongoing progress that Democrats are making in the six major urban counties. You can see here that Beto O'Rourke posted higher raw totals than Hillary Clinton in all but Harris County. And that never happens, right? No off-year non-presidential election has higher turnout than a presidential year. Never, ever, anywhere, right? <laughs> so Beto O'Rourke broke the curve. If you're in class with him, you're really pissed right now, right? He, he, he completely messed up um, the test. And told the raw numbers increased in all these different places. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, turnout fell, however, right? You can see turnout did fall a little bit. And Harris County was the one exception where he didn't quite get up to, to Hillary Clinton's totals. So to read this one, right, Beto's on top, Hillary Clinton's on the bottom in each cell. The next column, Ted Cruz is on top, and um, Donald Trump right below that. So you can see Cruz's numbers dropped precipitously from where Trump was. That's to be expected. Beto's did not, that's unusual, right? So Beto did higher, better than Her Hillary Rodham Clinton. Um, he beat Cruz by larger margins in all of these areas. Um, and of course, statewide, right, uh, Trump um, defeated Clinton handily, right, and by a raw margin of some 800,000, the margin had fallen to 215 for Beto O'Rourke, right? So again, statewide, if we get back to the question of registration and turnout, um, these numbers are staggering year over year, right? We have to, as historians, political scientists, you have to compare the presidential election years to the previous one. So we look at, and same with the off year. So we look at 2018, we can compare it to 2014, the last time there was a US Senate race. Anyone know the guy who ran for Senate in 2014? <laughs> David Alamil, right? It was a disaster, even the primary was a disaster. One of the people who made it into the runoff wanted to impeach Obama, and she was running as a Democrat, right? She made it to the primary runoff for the Democratic Party. Um, but you can see, right, how this is reflected in the numbers, that um, registered voters increased, right, by 12%, but turnout increased by 80%, and the Democratic vote by 153%, from one and a half million to four million. And even if you compare 2018 to 2016 on the right, you can see that registered voters went up, turnout fell a little bit in absolute terms, right? But overall, the Democratic vote increased statewide by 4.3%. So Beto beat Hillary easily. <laughs> um, of course, he wasn't running against her. So all of this shows that, um, that the Democratic strategy should be about turnout, right? Not registration. An increase of 700,000 registered voters did not make Beto, right? Um, it was the turnout operation on the bottom. Um, all right, so I wanna add that Beto's numbers were not really about him, right? It wasn't just the cool sign. It wasn't just his like dropping F-bombs and climbing up on tables and all that stuff that he did. 
right? It was really about the underlying organizing that's been taking place. So rather than his charisma, his victory or mere victory, his moral victory, right, was a product of the daily organizing and social movement work that's been happening across Texas. Work that preceded Trump's election, but has certainly been accelerated right, in recent years. So throughout the state, we're seeing this. Coalitions are coming together to elect very liberal mayors right, in different Texas cities, Houston and San Antonio. Right? Um, they're on the march in Dallas. They elected a very liberal district attorney there. Uh, right? Fort Worth and Tarrant County have now turned blue. And young people right, are out in the streets marching for immigrant rights. Uh, and, and this is a movement that we can trace back at least to 2006 to the mega marches, but they're pushing in new ways, right? Fighting the state, show me your papers law, SB4, fighting uh, to retain DACA, holding know your rights clinics, um, doing all of this work uh, every day to, uh, to advocate on behalf of immigrants. And so one key organization is United We Dream. There's a big chapter in Houston, other places uh, in, in Fort Worth where I live, there's a local group called United Fort Worth that's doing incredible work um, fighting on behalf of immigrants, and that's having a ripple effect across the political spectrum. And it's doing it in exactly the way I described in the history, right? People who didn't care about politics ever are coming out and voting in municipal elections for the first time in their lives because an, a movement organization, an immigrant rights group, is coming to their house and asking them to consider voting, right? And they'd never done that before. Along with immigrant rights, there's Black Lives Matter. Um, Texas has emerged as a key battleground in this struggle. Um, fights against police brutality, against the criminal justice system of mass incarceration. Of course, on the top left is Miss Sandra Bland, right, who's a native Texan, um, and who uh, inspired all sorts of innovative grassroots organizing, right, even if she herself um, did not live to see it. Um, on the bottom left, Texas Organizing Project is forming grassroots organizations in, um, in San Antonio, Houston, Dallas, um, all of them doing really uh, uh, powerful work in the area of criminal justice reform. They fought for and won uh, cash bail reform, right? So that you can't be put in jail forever just because you're too poor to afford bail. Right? You can no longer be sentenced to cash only bail systems right? in Harris County because of the work of Top. Um, Top and others formed a coalition that elected Sylvester Turner as mayor, right? With the pledge around criminal justice reform and they are now working to hold him accountable to that pledge. Right, to make Houston, as he said, the, the, the national leader when it comes to criminal justice reform. And they're doing it, right? So there's the cash bail one, there's the effective decriminalization of marijuana, which of course has uh, racially disparate enforcement, right, that produces uh, prisons full of black and brown folk. Um, Top and all these other groups are also fighting for African descended immigrants, black immigrants from the Caribbean and from Africa. Right, so here they are fighting for TPS, temporary, temporary protected status for uh, black immigrants from Haiti. They're forming coalitions with Latinos and with Middle Eastern immigrants. And there's close personal bonds developing between these activists, between folks in Black Lives Matter Houston and folks in United We Dream Houston. And we can see the movements beginning to converge. Across Texas, there were women's marches, right, in response to Trump's election, 50,000 at least in Austin on Inauguration Day in 2017. We see um, huge numbers of people showing up at the Capitol to, to advocate for reproductive rights and on behalf of LGBT issues, right? There was a multiracial alliance that confronted the legislature's effort to pass a bathroom bill, uh, uh, SB3, and it went down to defeat. So we can see those battles happening as well. On the left, there's a whole explosion of liberal and further left organizations statewide, even in places you wouldn't think. Indivisible Smith County, right, outside of Tyler. Um, right? Here in this area, we see new democratic organizations. We see the, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, cropping up all over Texas. Um, you know, which, um, and, and their membership is now, I think, exceeding the historic high of, of the Socialist Party in Texas more than 100 years ago. Among other things, they, DSA and Indivisibles and Labor have won paid sick leave ordinances in Houston, in San Antonio, uh, and, in, and in Dallas. I'm sorry, San Antonio is still in the works. Um, and they're winning. Organized labor is even back in Texas, right? Which you wouldn't guess, but they are, and they're innovating. They formed a new youth wing called YAL, Young Active Labor Leaders. They staged a huge march on Inauguration Day in Houston. 
Um, they bring together uh, groups like TOP, the Texas Organizing Project, and immigrant rights groups. They do something we call alt labor, where they're organizing unions in ways that are untraditional, like unions of taxi drivers in Austin. Um, and, uh, and they're also, of course, winning elections, right? There's a strike right now just uh, at General Motors uh, up in, uh, in Arlington, close to where I live. Uh, and they're fighting in the legislature. Organized labor for a long time has fought in the legislature to win um, uh, protections for working people, workers' comp, um, you know, basic protections, social services for working folks. Um, and, and you can also see that they've, on the left here, they've elected new membership. This is Montserrat Garabay, who is the new secretary treasurer of the Texas AFL-CIO, right? herself a Latina, a teacher, and uh, 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 really the face of this, of this new look for organized labor uh, in Texas and beyond. And, and these people, again, the official labor movement are joining together with the DSA, with Black Lives Matter groups, with immigrant rights groups, with LGBT groups, and they're fighting battles in a whole variety of different fronts. So taken together, the moment in Texas is now ripe, right? A new coalition is in fact emerging with clear parallels to the alliance of the 1960s. Labor, immigrant rights, Black Lives Matter, independent liberals and in, in the indivisibles, radicals like the DSA, um, all of them coming together and fighting a wide range of different justice struggles. They're also connecting electoral politics with these social movements. Right? The Democratic Party in Texas is no longer just about being a lighter version of the Republican Party. It's no longer just about Ann Richards and her hair, as great as that is, right? It's, it's really about uh, um, fighting on behalf of all of these different causes, and, and it's re-energizing the party, and this is what nearly carried Beto to victory. And if anything's gonna make Texas purple in 2020, it's going to be this groundwork, right? More than the presence of any particular candidate. So if history is any indication, Democrats and other progressives must embrace the strategy of earlier activists, right? Instead of focusing just on the white suburbs or winning over independence, or white women for that matter, they need to focus on aligning their struggles with the daily lives and social movements on the ground, making politics relevant by organizing their many bases. As in the 1960s, the more explicitly liberal, the more anti-racist, the more anti-sexist they become, they'll be able to build a more massive volunteer army of block workers that can focus on turnout, right? And turnout is the thing that matters most. So then, and only then, will Texas turn blue. That's it, thank you. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.